she answers he thinks that that you know it's a young girl skiving off school so he says are your parents home and she goes no they're not he goes well okay well maybe you can help me i hear there's a shooting going on she goes oh yeah it's me and she just chats away Welcome to Crime News Insider. This is Jorge Del Portillo. And unfortunately, Lori Hoff, our co-host, could not make it today. She was hauled away uh, indisposed for today's interview. But today we have a very special guest. You know, one of our listeners recommended a book called I Don't Like Mondays by N. Lee Hunt. And this book is about the true story behind America's first modern school shooting. The timing of this episode is apropos because we're recording this on May 26, 2023, just about one year after the horrific Uvalde school shooting in Texas. This book uncovers some of the key details behind the 1979 school shooting at Cleveland Elementary School in the San Carlos community of San Diego, California. And this shooting is deemed as, as we said, uh, one of the first modern American school shootings. So with that, we have a very special guest, and Lee Hunt, the author of the book. Sir, welcome to the podcast. Jorge, thank you for having me. It's so wonderful to speak to somebody from San Diego again. I've been away too long, and it's just great to hear your voice. And I know that there is sunshine in the background behind you, and I miss that. I'm here in the UK, <laughs> and, right. and I just it's just great to speak to San Diego again. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah, can you tell the listeners about, and thank you to our listener, uh, Joe Astor, who wrote in and recommended this book. I listened to the book on, on Audible. It was fantastic. Can you tell the, our listeners a little bit about yourself and your connection to San Diego? Well, um, my father used to be the uh, assistant city editor for the Tribune way back in the 70s. We're going quite back a bit. Um, the Tribune is now, of course, bonded with the union and, and lots have changed that. But back then, there was the evening newspaper. And so we, you know, we moved from England as kids and we were living the American dream. And um, there was... For me, the most famous school shooting of all time happened in San Carlos, not far from where I was living at the time, and our schools were put on lockdown. And mm -hmm. It was something we didn't really understand, and I don't think any 10-year-old would understand. Uh, my father sat me down and, and had a, uh, a big discussion with me at the end of that day and explained to me what happened and what was going on and how you know maybe the world has changed. And he had some intimate knowledge because those who know the story or don't know the story, the, the newspaper reporters from the Tribune actually called the house and she answered and spoke to them right. and gave them the famous quote in the middle of her uh, uh, essential attack on the school across the road. She said, I don't like Mondays. It livens up the day. And it was something that's moved my father. And, and I, you know, I, I went to high school in San Diego. I, you know, I graduated, I left San Diego. I went to, you know, off to my studies and did and back to the world. And then I ended up in, in England again, of all places, and I'm still living there now. But I, I, I feel San Diegan. Um, I think anyone who grows up in San Diego knows that once you get there, you kind of don't leave. And I'm one of the few that does. Um, my, my parents still live out there. Oh, really? And they love it. And I'm, I'm, I'm the strange one who's left. And, <laughs> and there's a day that goes by that doesn't make me want to come back to San Diego and how much I love it. I think you described Uvalde. Uh, and and that's a really moving one as well. And there've been a number mm -hmm. of school shootings. Let's not, let's not pretend there haven't been. Right. It's, it's, it, there's been so many, it's hardly a phenomenon anymore. Uh, the one Uvalde that really, and, th and that happened whilst kind of finishing the book and getting it published. What was so upsetting about that is that in 1979 in San Diego, the cops were answering the call by radio. There was no 911. There was none of this school shooting criteria or, or training or any of the different hours training that they do in schools. So these cops were running blindly into it and performed with, with absolute vigor and heroicism. And, and I'm in awe of all of the police officers that attended yeah. that day and, and the inspectors and the interrogators, everyone behaved and, and performed incredibly well. And then 43 years later, Uvalde happens. And yet, mm. The police officers, with all their training, with all their knowledge, with all their the skill, um, were not standing up for the children and taking care of of, of, of a crisis. And I, I think again, we don't know the whole ins and outs of it, um, but it certainly did give gravitas to my story. And I and I and I take real pride in the fact that now, finally, forty three years later, I've been able to capture a shooting that that really changed the world, and we've learned nothing from it. Uh, well, look, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I'm making it sure. careful, but really, if we take the two cases, the, some of the most recent and some of the first ones, even, even Whitman in, in Texas in 66, mm -hmm. uh, the, the behavior of the police officers was very different then than they are now. And, and, uh, 
yeah. And luck, luckily, see, Nashville could could have been a lot worse and was avoided this. I'm getting into the detail, but but the, the, the truth remains. Brenda Spencer in 1979 was probably the first child to pick up a gun and shoot at a school that she attended. And that's what makes her the first modern shooter. Big debate on that. It, it, sure. It's not the debate. The, the debate is why is it still happening, not who's the first. Right. Um, and Brenda's in prison. And that's where she belongs. Where she yes. deserves to be. Let's let's uh, talk about this case because when I listen to the book, I'm listening to it again in preparation for this interview. You can tell how much research that you did in this case. Can you tell our listeners just kind of the the bird's eye view of what happened that January morning in 1979, and how did the shooting evolve? Okay, um, yeah, so, wow, well, it's a big story, but yeah. in a nutshell, of it is. Brenda Spencer's a, a 16 year old girl. She's being she's slightly undeveloped. Her best friends were were children a couple years younger than her. She was running around the neighborhood. She was kind of the big shot amongst her friends, kind of an unknown at Patrick Henry High School where she was attending. People didn't really kind of give her any notice. You know, this was the 70s. Right. So, you know, people were wearing the flared jeans and the and the and the, and the trainers and the and, the, and the, the the long parted down the middle hair. You know, this is not like this is not a Kardashian type world that we have today. There's no selfies. It, it's, it just was a different world back then. And the 70s were a strange time as well. You're thinking of the wake of Patty Hearst and, and her abduction and what was going mm-hmm. on there, the, the Manson family. There was a lot of things happening in the 70s, um, some of the riots and gangster things that were going on at the time. Uh, the 70s was just a different time. Um, one day, she had told her friends that I am going to do something big and I'm going to be famous for it. Right. Whether that really happened or not, I don't know. They were all such young children. Her, her father um, gave her a 22 rifle for her for her birthday, or sorry, for Christmas. And this is a huge discussion point for people around the world because giving a child a gun is not something that happens um, many places of the world, a lot in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, but it isn't unusual. Her family is from Arkansas. She had mm-hmm. she had had a pellet gun for many years. Um, she had she had worked hard. She had proved that she can take care of a weapon. Her family in Arkansas all had weapons. I don't think in my research that it's that um, absurd in American context for for kids sixteen to have a weapon, especially a small twenty two. It's considered the the child's gun, if you will. A and starter I know I, rifle, I, right? Yeah, starter rifle, exactly. And right. I know I'm down talking that, and that's quite it's, it's quite a, a motive language I'm using to say that a 16 year old given a weapon for you know, but it is what it is. And back then it happens, and it still happens to this day. So one day she decided that she's just going to skive off school. She doesn't go. She tells her father that she's suffering from PMS and that she's not feeling very good. She'd been in and out of some truancy schools. She'd she was suspended from Patrick Henry and went to an alternative school. And then she just picks up the gun. And this is the interesting part. She breaks two of the windows. Her, her top of her door had those, those, uh, those type of doors that have sort of the, the triangle frames, not triangle, diamond-shaped frames uh, of glass. And she broke two corner pieces low down so she could kind of get on her knees kind of and shoot the rifle. And she just chose to pluck kids as they arrived to school across the street. It's a classic California elementary school so cars are pulling up the 22 has a pop rifle it's not it's not a big bang as you hear on television it really was a pop 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 people thought it was fireworks it just so happened it was the weekend of the chinese new year people you know there's many reasons why people didn't realize where it was coming from and 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 as it was hitting them people weren't understanding what was happening so she was able to just unload round after round after round and reload um you know, she she saw more than a dozen people. She killed the principal and the custodian. She wounded right. the, the, the children. She shot a, a police officer when he arrived. And it was only the heroics of, of the SDPD who were arriving from different parts of the city. Some were getting off shifts. Some were coming on their shift at that time in the morning. There was no sort of depots or sort of, the, I call them cop shops in the book. There were no sort of like smaller places where the police would come from. So they all came from downtown, San Diego mm-hmm. in 1979. You know, is not the massive city that it is now. And they arrive, and one of them, a, a hero named Ted Kasignac, who's still a hero to this day, and and, and I hold him high, high regard, he commandeers a, a rubbish truck, a, a big trash right. truck. Yeah. And right. dro- na- narrowly drives it in front of the victim, not actually knowing where the bullets were coming from. In, in front of the so, shooter, in front of Brenda, well, to, he actually, or yeah, to, he, blocking, blocking her shot of the victims. Yeah, and that's quite interesting because uh, when I spoke to Ted about this, I said, you know, how did you know where to go? And he said, I didn't. 
Oh. I just knew where the victims were and where the trajectory was coming from. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you, so here's, here's a guy, you know, he's a family man, you know, putting himself in a vehicle, not, knowing, even, not even knowing how big the weapon is or where it's coming from or who's shooting or how many drives this trash truck to block the victims. And, wow. and once that truck arrived, she was pegging the bullets off of it. And slowly she stopped shooting and they managed to get a hold of her by telephone and they had the big discussion. Six hours later, she surrenders. The part about this that, that really that struck me when I, when I first spoke with Brenda herself and formed a relationship with her was um, she doesn't have remorse like other people you speak mm. to who have done things, horrible things. She's sorry. She feels bad for the victim, but she doesn't have an overbearing remorse for it. Mm. And I found that to be quite striking. Um, you, you were corresponding with her while she's in prison. I still correspond with her. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, we're not pen pals. We're not buddies. Um, <laughs> she's looking to get out of prison and she doesn't think my book has helped her. Mm. I've told the truth. You know, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I tried to stick to the facts. I tried to reach out to all the people that I could. And luckily my father worked for the newspaper. I worked for the trip and stayed in the business until he retired. Mm. And I managed to meet a number of, of, of his colleagues from the seventies very happy to tell the story. They were all shocked that nobody had ever written a book about this before. They so were shocked. Did I. They were shocked when the, the FBI have never spoken with Brenda. None of the profilers have ever spoken with Brenda. Nobody at any time since the shooting to this day, and you think about how many school shootings we've had and how much valuable information she might be holding in her brain, no one has ever spoken to her. Wow. And, and I think she was surprised to actually hear that I was writing the book. At first, she said, I wish she wouldn't, but then she kind of embraced the idea and, and helped me with some information. Um, also, I was lucky. I have, I have a friend of mine named Steve Zazueta, uh, a, a highly decorated police officer and a great guy. Yes. I contacted him and I said, Steve, do you know anybody who's, you know, you might know people who know people. And luckily, the fraternity of, of SDPD got together and helped me out. And mm -hmm. then they got, and I got in touch with the original um, um, interrogator and some of the people who were on site, um, the, the, the snipers. You know, right. the guys who were actually up on the roofs doing the sniping. And they were so great. They they informed me what was going on um, in San Diego at the time and how SWAT was essentially – SWAT was a bag you had in the, in the, in the boot of your car that you, <laughs> you pulled out and turned into a SWAT guy. It's not like we see on television where the big trucks rolled in. Yeah, you, you talk about you know, even some of the bulletproof vests that were issued to the cops then are not the same that they're on now and the SWAT team then you – know, Kevlar, what was Kevlar? The, right. these, these are essentially pieces of steel put in tiny little bibs. They were like catcher's gear, you know? These guys are running in harm's way, and there's videos you can, you can look on YouTube and actually watch it, and it's almost unbelievable that, that, that these guys and gals, and, and I, must, I must reiterate that, that a number of the police officers on the scene were, were female, and that was quite rare for right. cities of San Diego size to have female police officers. That's how far back we're going. You know, and, and they were on the scene and they were pinned down from the bullets as well. And, 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 and their pastoral care to the children was immense. I, I think from doing the research, speaking to police officers and some of the teachers who were on the scene and with the, the newspaper reporters who were there watching it, I think this is a textbook example of how to exactly, you know, extinguish a, a school shooter who's off campus. Right. And I think San Diego, if you look at the annals of school shootings, and I know there have been some horrific uh, shootings in San Diego. Of the ones that were off campus, deaths were averted for right. similar reasons. Awareness, <laughs> and I'm speaking specifically of, of, of Kelly and, and of, of Granite Hills, mm -hmm. but there are, there are some other shooters in San Diego. And I think the awareness because of it, because of this attention it's drawn, has actually, I know it probably doesn't sound like it, but probably has made San Diego safer within school districts because of the awareness. And I, and I wrote with that kind of idea of I'm not glorifying the crime, and I'm not the first to write a true crime story, and I'm not the first to write about Brenda, but I am the first to actually get the actual facts of what happened. Um, her father was not an alcoholic. They mm -hmm. were not poor. He had land off, off, you know, down in Potrero, Potrero. He, you know? Yeah. Um, he just was tight and he was an odd guy. And when she shoots is arrested, she then, and this is where we get into the legality of it. This is probably why I wanted to speak to you so much about this, because there's a part of the book that I think, you know, the bit I'm going to talk about. He's plea bargaining with Chuck Patrick, the, the trial deputy DA at the time. Mm -hmm. And they're discussing, she's pleaded guilty, rightly so, she's banged her rights. But instead of going through a, um, a, a lengthy sentencing where they would do an investigative study of her family, her life, her home, she plea bargains to 35 to life. 
at a moment when probably, I mean, you know, they were still debating whether she, she was only 16, was she a child, was she adult? But we find out now that she did that because her father manipulated her to plea bargain so they don't do an invasive study of our lives because at that time he was having a, uh, a romantic relationship with a 16-year-old girl who mm-hmm. she was who was her cellmate at juvenile hall. So he had a pension for young girls. There's, there's no words to describe Wally Spencer. And, and I, we can only guess that what Brenda is claiming now that she was, you know, she was interfered with by her father at the time that she lived there. And this is one of the reasons why she acted out. I, I'm not in a position to suggest she's lying, but there's certainly that was never brought up for years and years and years to laugh at the fact. Um, but Brenda's in prison um, mm-hmm. and she's up for probably her seventh parole attempt. And uh, I think the, the chances of her getting out is, is probably slim. And there's right. a side of me, having spoken to her, that I think that she doesn't want to get out either. I mm. think she's aware of who she is. I think she's aware of, of the pariah that she is. And I think she's possibly in fear of, of, of a retribution. I, I don't know. I, mean, I, I don't know. She hasn't said that. She does talk about the days she's going to get out, but she's made a little effort to yeah. really do anything proactive. I don't know. And let, let's let's go back to the shooting because you're the only one that's corresponded with her, talked with her since the shooting. Mm-hmm. But during the shooting, as you mentioned, people from was it the Tribune, right? Yeah. It was before the Union and, and the Tribune it merged. It's called the Evening Tribune. So the it was evening the afternoon Tribune. paper. So uh-huh. th- they would already be writing their stories about about the time that this is happening. They're and submitting someone, their stories for the 12 o'clock press. But they're just calling random houses that are by the elementary school to ask about the shooting. And they happen upon the house across the street where Brenda Spencer is shooting and she picks up the phone. Yeah, and, and, and it is a stroke of luck because back in those days when you had phone books and, <laughs> and for your young listeners, we can explain what a phone book is. But, <laughs> so, and they also had something called the crisscross directory, which a lot of police officers and, and, and journalists had, which was essentially you could look up the address and find out the name of who lived there and the phone number. Oh, so sure. that's exactly what they did. They got the phone call. They heard down at the cop shop in, 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 in downtown that there was a shooting up in San Carlos. First of all, and I think even today, you could say to people, where's San Carlos? And people go, I don't know. Right. And you'll say, well, it's between La Mesa and, and Lake Murray. Oh, okay, that little stretch of land. Yeah. Right. So, um, and I didn't know where San Carlos was as a 10-year-old. So, And my dad is a journalist who wrote about San Diego, didn't know where San Carlos was. So <laughs> you get this phone call that's over in San Carlos. I know even it's, some it's of almost... The- you say even some of the dispatchers that, they're, you know, they're no. calling from the school. They have to explain where San Carlos is. You know, do, yeah. is it sheriff's jurisdiction? Is it San Diego PD jurisdiction? It's, it, it, it's, it's that shape of San Diego where, where, the, where it's sort of the part of the city actually pokes out into the, what is known as the county. So on three sides of San Carlos, it's actually the sheriff's department. Wow. So it, it, just, it just is what it is. But yeah. that being said, the police response rate was incredible. It was incredible. It really, it was incredible. So Steve Wiegand is his name. He went on to have a very prestigious uh, journalist career. He went to Sacramento and did a lot of political stuff, and he's written a couple books. He's a great guy. Um, He essentially was on his way to L.A. to do a political thing. And my dad and and, and the other the editors there said, hey, look, we got a shooting. All the other reporters are out for the day getting their stories. (laughs) <laughs> that's how you did it back then. You didn't sit on Twitter and, and steal stories like you do today as a journalist. I'm not saying they do that, but they do. Anyway, <laughs> so they actually had to go out and hit the beat and get a story. So he was just hanging around the bullpen. And and I think he was kind of just the unlucky guy on the spot. My dad threw him the crisscross directory and said, there's a shooting in San Carlos at this school. Here's the address. Start phoning around. See if you can find anybody who's seen it. So mm-hmm. and Brenda Spence's phone number at the time, I think was, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think it was whatever the, the dining code was, and then three, four, five, six. So I think when he opened the crisscross directory and saw that one, I think that was the one he just went for first. It was just a matter oh. of of, wow. the, of the coincidence of it. She answers, he thinks that that, you know, it's a young girl skiving off school. So he says, Are your parents home? And she goes, No, they're not. He goes, Well, okay, well, maybe you can help me. I hear there's a shooting going on. She goes, Oh yeah, it's me. And she just chats away. They hang up. Wow. There's, a, there's a bit of an exchange. They have to call her back. They bring in, they start writing the story already. They bring in someone else to chat to her. And the, the, the two journalists end up speaking to her and getting an awful lot from her. Eventually, and this has only been revealed in my book, and I actually had to speak to a lot of people about it. The police call the trip and call my dad and say, 
get off the phone. We're trying to get a hold of her. Right. Get it, knock it off. You know, and Bill Collender at the time was, was the police chief and he had a great, he was a great relationship with everybody in, in mm-hmm. the trip at the time. So they were like, okay, wow, you know, let's stop. You know, we've, we've got the call. And eventually they, she answers again for them. They start talking, they turn off the power. They do all the things that, that you do with a negotiation. And, and eventually she, she, uh, she comes out. They coaxed her to come out, you know, lay down her weapons, bring out all the ammo, and she turns herself in. But the yeah. it was the reporter that obtained those key phrases of to show her motive or her lack of um, yeah. respect for life, you know. And that's when she said, "I don't like Mondays." Yeah, actually, all of the all of the quotes that are easily Googleable or in, in my book are all from the reporters. Mm. So they were all actually said to reporters before she spoke with the police. Her tone it's quickly ve- changes. Her very quickly disturbing. Changes the police right. It is disturbing. It is disturbing. But, but playing devil's advocate, and I'm not suggesting that she's innocent because she isn't. Mm. She's a very young girl. She's very naive. If in fact she was being uh, interfered with by her father, she displays so much bravado mm-hmm. in those discussions. It's almost, it's almost unbelievable of a young girl to say those things from, you know, on the other, um, they are such bold statements moments after knowing that you've killed someone. Right. I mean, talking about, you know, picking off the the children, the colors of the jacket, it was just it's, you know, awful. Yeah. It, it's like watching the feathers fly. Right. When she was shooting the duffel coats, those remember those duffel vests that we all wore as kids, they were really, really popular in 1979. All the kids had them. So when her bullets hit the body, they were shooting up these bits of feather or bits of whatever it was that was inside there. And, she, you know, so, you know, I'm not 50 50 on this. I mean, she's a cold blooded killer. Let's be honest. I'm not suggesting mm-hmm. she isn't. But, you know, in the book, I, I try and just explain all the angles of how we could have gotten here. There's there's another small anomaly in there that that has never kind of been mentioned before, but it's been known, and I find it quite interesting. She broke two holes in the windows, as I say, to shoot. She discharged her twenty two rifle, which she knew would kill because she's killed rabbits with it and gophers as she went hunting with her father. But she also discharged her pellet gun, mm-hmm. knowing knowing far well that it would kill anyone. It might hurt. It might break a window. So she discharged. Yeah, she discharged both of those weapons. And when um, when she was asked by by Chet Thurston and, and Paul also two fantastic military trained interrogators who got her out safely and nobody else was hurt from the moment they got involved. Absolute brilliant. Um, they said to her, can you bring out the weapons that you're using? Because they have no idea what she's got. She brings out both her guns and sets them down on the ground like they are her prized possessions. So the hmm. famous photos, which are in the book, she has two weapons. But anything you read online only mentions the one weapon that she fired. But that's not true. She actually fired both, which leads to the idea of intent. Was she aware that she was going to kill? Certainly she would know the 22 kills because she does it with a 22. And she spoke about it on the phone. So she's well aware of what she's doing. Hmm. But then why fire the the, the pellet gun? I, I don't know. It's just one of the strange facts that, that, that fall into it. And then the interrogators ask her to go back in the house and get the ammunition. Most remarkably, right. I would thought, I, I, and you know, again, they were in complete control of the situation to do that. And I asked Paul Olson specifically this, and he's, he's in Minnesota now tending to his farm. He's a really good guy. And he just said, look, um, I wanted the bullets. I wanted her to bring out all the things that she used to kill. Hmm. And I wanted her to be responsible for it. And I did it because we wanted them. And I said, but you had her. The SWAT were in position. You could have tackled her the moment she came out of the house. He goes, no, nah, she wasn't going to hurt anybody. Wow. So, the, it, it, you know, Paul was in complete control of that moment. And he knew it. And he was chatting to a little girl who was probably by that time scared. Yeah. She was not the big bravado, watch the feathers fly. I love killing cops. You know, pigs must die kind of, you know, tough girl that she was five hours earlier. They had reduced her to the child that she was. Right. So it's kind of this juxtaposition of, uh, of you know, and 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 this the great debate, and I've spoken to a lot of people online, and 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 people like yourself doing podcasts, where you know she's guilty of the crime, she accepts it, she should be in prison probably for the rest of her life, and California law, she probably will be. But on the other hand, there is this tender sort of vulnerable Brenda side where she was just a little girl, right, and she's and, sixteen, yeah, and and she was tiny for her age, and mm-hmm. so. I don't know. I, I don't sympathize for her because she's, she, you know, she did what she did. But on the other hand, 
you know, gosh darn it, Brenda, couldn't you, you know, sure. could, what could we have done? You know what I mean? My world would have been differently different because I was 10 when it happened and all of, and all of my contemporaries at school. And this is, we've spoken about this hundreds and hundreds of times. It really? changed our lives. It yeah. shaped us as San Diegans. And, and my love of true crime and my writing and all the stuff that I, that I do, this was it. This was yeah. the start of it. And you can ask any true crime person or even, I suppose, prosecutors or people in the you, you know, what made you do what you do? I, there must have been some moment where you thought I can, you know, for me, it was this crime. And uh, yeah. nobody's written about it. So yeah. I took my time. I got the facts. I called on all my resources, everybody I knew, to make sure I capture it once and for all. I had to get the facts down because I didn't, I didn't want to lose it. Brenda's not going to be around forever. And certainly nobody's going to study this again. So mm -hmm. you know what? The, I was going to say that the detail is amazing. The detail is amazing. I mean, just from the dispatch, you know, with, with the Astria, the helicopter, just the, yeah. the, the ground, like everything of that makes it real and it, any kind of school shooting especially like this it's just unfathomable that this could be done and you uncover so much detail that gets us a little bit more insight but at the same time it it leaves us with still more questions and i think that's down to brenda mm -hmm. i think it really is down to brenda um you know in in my work i speak i've spoken to a number of school shooters now and i'm a, i'm actually speaking to another other san diego shooters as well mm -hmm. and their behavior and and, and their the, the culture that they have or been instilled in prison is very different from brenda's you know brenda's in with with betty broderick mm -hmm. in prison they are not friendly uh despite okay. what would you see on the internet they are not friendly she is though very friendly with the, the two manson sisters who've just recently been denied parole wow she's very close with them and and you know this is her life this is their life I suppose. Um, as a side note with Betty Broderick, which is interesting, her husband, who who she she ended up killing for those who know California crime is quite a big case. It um, is. He actually he actually was the attorney for the victims that Brenda shot. And they were suing Wally with his house insurance because she shot from that. And I and I go into that in the book. It's part of the legality because it's important, because it made Wally close up shop. And 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 not want to. He didn't want what's best for his daughter. He wanted what was best for him. Mm -hmm. And you asked Brenda about that connection. Yeah, you told Brenda about that connection with uh, Brenda. Was, Brenda was unaware. Right. Uh, she was unaware of that, and I pointed that she was actually unaware of a lot of things in the book in regards to her family. Oh wow. She didn't know an awful lot about her mother and where she came from, which which to me only shows that either she wasn't interested, which I tend to believe that, but also mm -hmm. her parents weren't interested to share either. Hmm. So, I mean, her mother comes from a, a, a fairly prestigious family, not prestigious, but, you know, a family of some note that, that moved to San Diego and became counselors. And, you know, the, you know, they were movers and shakers in the area. Even even to this day, her mother is is running bowling leagues and a little bit of a leader in her own right. Perhaps hmm. things would have, been, would have been different if Brenda had lived with her when she was 16. I don't know. I don't know. Let, let's talk about uh, the parole hearings that you covered frequently and even mentioned, you know, here at the San Diego DA's office, we send a deputy DA to handle the lifer hearings. And for those of you that don't know, every certain amount of years, someone can be up for parole, even though they're sentenced to life in prison, they are parole eligible and they have to go through this parole hearing. We call it a lifer hearing. And to see whether or not the defendant or the, the killer has expressed remorse, changed her ways. And some of the things that she mentioned was, for example, oh, I was high on PCP at the time. What did you make of that? Uh, I, 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 okay. Um, well, let's go back. Brenda was arrested. She was taken downtown. Her toxicology reports come back as negative, no alcohol, no drugs, no nothing. Mm -hmm. Despite what it says on the internet and other places, there was no alcohol in the house. There was a single bottle of, of, of Southern Comfort that was undrunk. The mm -hmm. father didn't drink a lot of alcohol. The brother had a bit of a tipple, but was more of a pot smoker back then. There was no drugs anywhere to be found. There were no drugs on her. There were no drugs in her. Years later, you know, 2001, she, she's sorry, sorry, in the 90s, sorry. In the 90s, she starts saying that, I was so high on drugs. It must have been somebody else. I didn't do it. Then she said, I was so high on drugs. I didn't know what I was doing. I saw commandos coming and I just freaked and started shooting. Right. Um, you know, and it holds a little water. Let's be honest. She, she happens to pick the one drug 
that is also the most expensive for a girl who didn't have a job and a father who was very tight. Her lunch money would not have bought her PCP, mm-hmm. let's be honest. Secondly, it's the only drug that wasn't detectable by the modern medical technologies. So mm-hmm. they could test for all other compounds, all other drugs in the system. It was the one that was untestable. Just so happens that that was the one I was taking 15 years later. You know what? Does it hold water? For me, no. Right. For me, no. Would would a and again, I'm not a I'm not a, an authority on drugs. I'm not a psychologist. I'm, I'm just someone who who's spoken to Brenda and spoken to the police officers, the people there at the time. She was incredibly, according to Steve Wiegand, the reporter, and to, to Paul Olson, the the, the uh, interrogator. She was so coherent mm-hmm. at the times that they spoke to her. One during the shooting, the other one just after the shooting. So coherent that there was no even thought at the time that she was on drugs. Exactly. So you've got every witness, you've got everybody on the site, on, on you know, at the place. You've got Brenda herself, who doesn't mention it for years afterwards. Um, probability? I say no. Right. Yeah. I mean, that was my take too. Just the yeah. the quotes that you um, quoted to the reporter Wiegan and her conversations yeah. with the hostage, or not the hostage, the, the, the negotiator. Uh, yeah. really betrays a person that is lucid and and mm-hmm. coherent and all that. And I feel like this is one of those things that maybe in prison she heard of, you know, because she f- was part of some group too, right? That of people yeah. wrongfully convicted because of PCP or something. And there's and there's some evidence suggests that that, that happened sure. within the California sure. Institution of Women. What, what we're talking about is that um, often um, people who are hysterical going into prisons of, of, of both sex, male and female, they were given drugs to calm them down. And some mm. of the female incarcerees claimed that they were being drugged to make the prison guards life easier and to make the prison people or the, the, the bailiff, who are the people taking to court? You would know the, bail- yeah, the people, bailiffs. Mm-hmm. Is that what they are? Bailiffs, bailiffs taking court to make their lives either easier. They were drugging a lot of the, uh, the accused Mm -hmm. and brenda of course jumped onto this and it may very well that brenda you know she's done a lot of drug rehab courses in prison Mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be out of the realms of possibility to say that she became a drug user whilst in prison what we do know is that on the day that she went to prison her toxicology report came up clean clean yeah but the neighbor kids in in the neighborhood were very clear in saying that brenda took drugs okay and they were very clear in saying that they took that Brenda took her father's prescription pills. Mm, and that her, you know, so her pension to use drugs, is that, is that crazy for a 16 year old in San Diego to take a bit of drugs? I no. say no, I, I say no, it's not the craziest thing I've ever heard. Is it crazy for her to take so much PCP that she doesn't know what she's doing and then shoot out her house to children? Right. Yeah, it, it's just wicked crazy. And in fact, she'd be in prison for the rest of her life crazy. And again, I'm just saying that for the act, I'm, I'm trying to be impartial, but I've, I've said it now. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the evidence is yeah. s- suggesting that it's not well. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so much in the book. There's a, a lot of interesting details. I mean, I, I recommend the book because I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, where, where can you buy the book? Uh, you can buy it on anywhere. Amazon. Yeah. Grab it on Amazon. It's also on Audible. You can okay. pick up the uh, luckily it's not me reading it. The guy who reads it speaks a lot slower than me. So it's actually <laughs> you can you can understand it. But, you know, I've lived and breathed this for so long, like so many San Diegans and and I think one of the things I loved about writing the book was because I miss San Diego so much and just talking mm-hmm. to you makes me feel like home again. I, in the book, I try and capture a lot of things that are going on in San Diego in the late 70s and early 80s, just because I think it's relevant. I think that anybody who grew up in San Diego in the 70s w- will know someone like Brenda. Of course, they may not know someone who did what Brenda did, sure. but they know somebody who was similar to her. Mm-hmm. Um, I also want to mention that there is a, a few chapters on Sir Bob Geldof himself because the song where I live in England, yes. I, I, I speak to a lot of people in Ireland and actually I'm, I'm on a, 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 another call not long after this one where I'll speak to people in Ireland. They are well aware of this case and it is the one that changed the world. So it's not just a San Diego case. You'd be surprised. There's an awful lot of people around the world who know this case. There's There are people who are, who are doing art of Brenda Spencer in Finland and Japan and they've sent mm. it to me. It's, it's almost creepy. This effect of this shooting and the song, specifically the song, has changed the world forever. Um, and and I if don't you know. read the book, you'll you'll know that this this band, the Boomtown Rats, released a yeah. song called "I Don't Like Mondays" in July of 1979, which was a direct direct response to this sh- uh, shooting. Yeah, they they were they were 
you know, they were a small time punk band coming out of, of Ireland. They're bum around London. They had a couple of hits here in Britain and they were looking to crack America. Like everybody wanted to, everybody wanted to be a big star in America. And it just so happens the day that they're kind of rocking into LA, Brenda does the shooting and, and Bob Geldof starts writing the song and they release it that July. And then they perform it in San Diego. <laughs> the Boomtown Rat really it was Cash from Chaos. Yeah. I don't think they had any idea. And you know, the whole, the whole line that's in it, tell me why I don't like Mondays. Tell me why I don't like Mondays. You know, I'm going to shoot the whole day down. It's, it's a snappy tune and Brenda likes it. Wow. Um, she does. <laughs> you know, it's a snappy little tune. It's got a great little piano riff. Why not like it? Um, I don't think she thinks much about, you know, I don't think she really puts her mind to, to really understanding that that song and what it means and how it affect, how it changed the world. And she will probably be in prison for the rest of her life because of the song. Oh, wow. It is possible that without all that type of international fame, it is possible. I mean, you know, Brenda shot a bunch of people. Yes. But there have been many other killers who have done worse, who have been let out of prison. Mm -hmm. and, and this song reached number one for four weeks in the UK, maybe didn't get a whole lot of traction in the U S but it was very controversial. It was in the news. San Diego did a want. Yeah. And actually it was played very, very rarely in the United States as a whole. I think mm -hmm. KGB played it once and then decided nah, it's a bad idea. Um, but also to note how big the song is, I mean, it was it was number one and a, and a huge no song. There was no one in Britain that you could mention that song and they don't know it. It is wow. played that often here and it is that popular a tune. Um, also, it was the only song that the Boomtown Rats played at Live Aid because Bob Geldof went on to do Live Aid and 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 the, the Famine in Africa supports. And he's supporting a number of other things. You know, he wrote Do They Know It's Christmas, co-wrote Do They Know It's Christmas. So, mm -hmm. you know... He, he, He's a very influential figure, Bob Geldof. He's Irish. Yes. He uses the moniker Sir Bob, but he shouldn't because <laughs> Sir is only for people who are from Britain, and he's not from Britain. Mm -hmm. But it, it helps him with his paycheck. So, so God bless Bob Geldof. <laughs> but he should he shouldn't be calling himself a Sir. There's a couple chapters about him in the book and how his life turned upside down. And so, you know, he didn't actually have a a, a, a fantastic life with his family either. And mm -hmm. and I try and relate this issue is that Brenda is 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 a is a killer and a murderer and belongs in jail, but she actually isn't the craziest person in her circumference, in her orbit. Mm -hmm. There are some other weirder people who actually follow her and surround her. And I try and bring that out a little bit. Um, anyway, thank you for enjoying the book. I, yes. I spent I, a long time writing it. I'm glad you liked it. I, yes. And as you could tell for our listeners, there's a lot of very interesting pieces to this. Some of it we didn't even get to like, there's a school security guard that may have tried to take credit for for Officer Kasanek's uh, movement of the truck. You know, there, there's yeah, a true. lot of good things in yeah. this book. So I highly recommend it to our listeners. Sir, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Before we go, we end each episode on a light note like we always do. Obviously, we're talking about a serious topic. Lori's not here to play this this game that we have. But are you willing to sit here and play for our listeners? OK, so let me get this right. You're, you're asking just, uh, you know, I'm. I'm just an amateur here, 6,000 miles away. You're going to ask me legal questions and okay. I am. Don't judge, but, <laughs> but I'll play. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Okay. So this is called Crime or Fiction. Each episode, I ask our guests of the laws on the books. Two are real. One is fake. And see if you could guess which law is a crime, which one is the fiction. Only one is a fiction. The theme is the Metropolitan Police Act of 1839. Section 54. So I don't know where you're living, if, if that covers it, but that's in the uh, London Metropolitan Police. So okay, yeah. you have a little bit I, I, of, of an, yeah, I'm just, an I'm edge. Just nor I'm just north of London, but the Met is well known. So, OK, okay. Let's, let's go. Let's do it. OK, so here we go. This is all public nuisances in the thoroughfares. Two are mm -hmm. real. One is fake. A, it's illegal to slide upon ice or snow to the common danger of the passengers. Again, this is the thoroughfares. Okay. B, it's illegal to use insulting words or behavior during the time of divine service. And C, it's illegal to ring a doorbell without lawful excuse. Two are real, wow. one is fake. So A is sliding upon ice or snow, endangering others. Mm -hmm. B, using insulting words or behavior during the time of divine service. And C, ringing a doorbell without lawful excuse. Oh, you know what? I'm going to go with sliding on the ice is the, is the uh, fake one. Okay. Any, any thoughts behind that? Just because the other two sound like, it sounds like Britain. 
<laughs> okay. Well, let's go to uh, C, since you think that one is legal. It's illegal to ring a doorbell without lawful excuse. You think this one is a crime, and this one is a crime. Uh, section 54, cool. subsection, paragraph 16 says, Every person who shall willfully and wantonly disturb any inhabitant by pulling or ringing any doorbell or knocking at any door without lawful excuse, or who shall willfully and unlawfully extinguish the light of any lamp is in violation. Okay. Have you ever uh, knocked on a person's door without lawful excuse? You don't have to admit you it. Know, <laughs> um, I, I don't recall. I okay, don't, good. Look, I'll tell you what, in the last three years, I don't think we've done many door knockings, have we, with, with the lockdown? <laughs> but no. After the pandemic. I don't, no, actually, you know what? I think I've needed a reason every time I've been to someone's house. Okay, there you go. Okay, so let's go to A. You think this one is a fiction. It's illegal to slide upon ice or snow to the common danger of passengers. And this one is a crime. This one oh. is on the books. Same section, subsection 17. It says every person not only just slide upon ice or snow, but flies a kite or plays a game to the annoyance of the inhabitants or passengers to the common dangers of passengers. Okay. Okay. So no kite flying, no playing games if you're annoying others. <laughs> right. But that that means B, it's illegal to use insulting words or behavior during the time of divine service that used to be on the books, not the divine service time. I yeah. added that part. But in 1986, <laughs> uh, the insulting words or behavior was on the books mm. and with the intent to provoke the breach of the peace. But that was repealed in 1986. So okay. if you're ever back in London, feel free to go over there and use insulting words and behavior. <laughs> Don't really, right? That's just Don't a really. joke, right? Yeah, that's a joke. <laughs> As a lawyer, I am not giving you legal advice. <laughs> well, uh, author Enley Hunt, thank you so thank much. You. you do us a great honor to be on our podcast. The book is called I Don't Like Mondays, the true story behind America's first modern school shooting. You can find it anywhere you could find a book. It's also on Amazon and Audible. Thank you so much, sir. Hey, Jorge, what a pleasure. It's so lovely to speak to San Diego, and I hope you enjoy the sunshine in the beach. I am, I'm internally jealous of you out there. <laughs> well, you're welcome back anytime. You know, you could write books from here, too. I'd love to. I'd love to, I'll tell you. Thanks, Jorge. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our listeners. Uh, I will put a link in the show notes for you if you want to purchase the book. And remember to check us out on social media and rate and review. And until next time, this is the Crime News Insider Podcast. on this podcast are solely of the speakers and do not reflect the views of the Deputy DA Association nor the District Attorney. Questions and comments can be sent to crimenewsinsider at gmail.com. Please leave a rating and review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to this show. Remember to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at San Diego DDAs. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Well,